Welcome back to the second half of our webcast on neuroscience and society. We have three more uh, speakers uh, to, that we'll present to you. To my immediate left is Adrian Raines, who is a professor of criminology. To his left is Jonathan Moreno, who's a professor of uh, bioethics, uh, as well as the history and sociology of science. And to his left is Stephen Morse, who is a professor of law. To start with, we'll begin with Adrian Rain, who will talk about the intersection of neuroscience and crime. Adrian? Thank you. One of the challenges that society is facing with new neuroscience knowledge is how we deal with prisoners who have a brain basis to their behavior, or who may have a brain basis to their behavior. This issue or dilemma really starts with neurological research which has indicated that patients who suffer damage to the underneath part of the frontal cortex are more likely to be psychopathic-like, to be antisocial and to break rules of society. Well, those are neurological cases, but what about murderers? What about violent offenders? Well, really, the science is not all that new. Fifteen years ago, we did a study on 41 murderers and matched them to 41 normal controls and compared their brain scans. What you see here in this slide is a picture of a brain scan of a normal control. You're looking down on the brain here. The warm colors, red and yellow, indicate high glucose metabolism. And as you see in the front part of the brain of the normal controls, you see a lot of activation, a lot of red and yellow, indicating high glucose metabolism, a good functioning prefrontal cortex. On the right, you, sh you see uh, the scan of a murderer, and you can see there a distinct lack of activation in that top part, the prefrontal cortex. And it makes some theoretical sense because the frontal cortex is very much involved in controlling and regulating both emotion and behavior. So it's as if the murderers have the emergency break on behavior broken. They get out of control if they're irritated. And actually, you know, there's a lot of problems with brain imaging research. There are issues in drawing causal conclusions, for example, from something which is just really a correlation. And also another complexity is not all murderers are alike. There are different types of murderers. And this poor frontal lobe functioning particularly characterizes murderers who are very impulsive. They don't plan, they don't regulate, and there's a lot of emotion behind the homicide. Whereas in contrast, murderers who plan, regulate, and control their violence, they don't show this lack of prefrontal functioning. So that's brain functioning and some evidence that violent offenders, as a group at least, may have poorer functioning in that regulatory part of the brain, the frontal cortex, the guardian angel on behavior. There's also structural impairments in violent offenders. For example, we went and recruited violent offenders, this time from the community, those who were not caught in Los Angeles, and we did structural brain imaging on these people. These were people from temporary employment agencies um, who perpetrated a lot of violence. We found that these individuals had an 11% reduction in the volume of grey matter, neurons, in that very frontal part of the brain. So there's both structural and functional impairment in violent antisocial offenders, and not just from our studies, from lots of studies in different countries. So it's beyond reasonable doubt that at least there's a relationship between poor frontal functioning, poor regulation, and antisocial violent behavior. It goes a bit further than that, though. We've been looking, for example, at individuals with a psychopathic personality and brain scanning them while they're doing a moral decision-making task. So what they're doing in the scanner is they're faced with a dilemma. You're on a footbridge over a railway line. There's a runaway train about to kill five workers on the railway line. If you do nothing, five people will die. But standing next to you on the footbridge is a large gentleman. Push him off, he dies, he blocks the train, but he saves five lives. What are you going to do? It's not really how the person answers this question, but what's happening in their brains, which is the critical issue. So in normal, non-psychopathic individuals, there's lots of activation in a brain region called the amygdala, as well as the frontal cortex. 
What you see, you see that on this scan here, on the left-hand side, you see activation of the amygdala in normal people. But on the right-hand side of the slide, you see that the higher the score of psychopathy, the lower the activation in the amygdala, a negative correlation. So, how does this all fit in with the law and justice and punishment and responsibility? Well, in law, I mean, one of the issues, of course, is does the individual know right from wrong? And I think I can assure you, psychopaths really do know the difference between right and wrong. But is there another question in the shadows here? Do psychopaths have the feeling for what is right and wrong? Because when I played that dilemma to you, did you not have the feeling of awkwardness and discomfort? We believe psychopaths lack that feeling. And without that feeling, perhaps there's no drive for good moral decision-making or moral decision-making in the appropriate direction. And this does come face-to-face -face with society, with law and issues of punishment and responsibility. One brief example, I defended a, a murderer and rapist who killed and raped a wonderful young woman in Colorado. We brain scanned him using the same techniques with, that we'd brain scanned the other 41 murderers with. And we showed that he had much poorer functioning in the prefrontal cortex. His scan is on the left-hand side of the slide, and on the right-hand side of the slide you see 62 normal controls. And here again, you can see that emergency break on behavior is just not there in this individual. But where do we go with that? This man was found guilty of first-degree deliberate murder, but the three-judge panel who decides punishment did not uh, um, execute. I mean, they, they, don't, they did not give him the death penalty. They brought in the brain imaging data. They also brought in his awful psychosocial history that you see here on this slide. He had an awful history of abuse, deprivation, brought up in one of the worst neighborhoods of the United States. Really, I mean, all the boxes were checked on this individual. I mean, he had all these social deficits, the family deficits, the brain deficits. You know, he was a walking time bomb waiting to explode. You know, is it any surprise he goes and kills and rapes somebody? Okay, so he didn't get the worst punishment, but is that really just? Where do we balance mercy with justice? Because, in a way, if you buy into the argument I gave at court, aren't you going to buy into anything? If you do something wrong, there's a reason why you do something wrong. There's always a cause. Is that going to excuse your behavior, my behavior, everyone else's behavior? That's one of the issues that we're having to face with now in the interface between neuroscience and the law, which Stephen Morse will talk about in more detail. Just one last point. It's not a throw-away-the-key approach. Yes, there is a biological basis to crime and violence, at least in part, but that doesn't mean we throw away the key. There are beginning clues about how we might be able to, if you like, repair the brains, partly at least, of antisocial violent offenders. For example, one study gave fish oil to prisoners and after five months they showed much um, a reduction in violent offending within the prison. And there are several other studies of aggressive behavior in children showing that fish oil, omega-3, can reduce aggressive behavior. Sounds a fishy story. F further research clearly has to extend and validate that. But we know omega-3 is critical for what? Brain structure, brain function. What do we find impaired in violent offenders? Brain function, brain structure. Could it be in the future that there are treatments for the brain bases to antisocial and violent behavior that we are currently uncovering? That's in the future. Right now, we've got to deal with those difficult issues about how do we deal in courts with individuals who have all the biological, genetic, and social boxes checked. Are they truly responsible for their actions? Do they know in terms of feeling the difference between right and wrong, how moral is it of us to punish them as harshly as we do if they lack the neural circuitry underlying appropriate moral decision-making? Thank you, Adrian.